Okay. Graham Coxon, pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. It's a pleasure. Um, eight solo albums, still going strong, never mind the blur career behind you. Uh, Where did you get your inspiration from? Um, I've no idea really. I think I sort of make it up as I go along. I, th I think I think a lot of the inspiration I get recently is probably from um, the TV. I think um, I've always sort of watched the news when I'm writing and particularly lyrics. So, um, or I go to coffee shops. I think, I think actually probably that means I, I, I'm inspired by, by just um, observation, mainly in the sea. Um, just thinking of little scenarios and stories about people I see. Hey, great stuff. But um, tonight the, uh, the gig is Philip's uh, Fidelio gig. Um, yeah. How did that come about? Um, well, I decided I'd like to be part of the launch for Philips Fidelia speak systems and things like that because um, you know I have a passion about sound reproduction, and so it just seemed like a good thing to to look at and and and, and you know just be a part of. You tried to uh, try them out yourself, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've tried out a um, um, very big dock for um, things like you know iPods and things like that and it's a, it's a sort of a much bigger substantial kind of permanent and beautiful thing rather than, the, than, than, than things I've used before that have been a ra rather cheap thing that I chuck in my bag but you know when I'm sort of dashing around going on holiday and stuff like that so 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 I, I guess it's more more like a a piece of furniture or something that's on my sideboard. Actually, so. mm -hmm. how, how do you record, you know, most of your albums? Is it always a different process each time, or do you stick to some sort of regimented sort of pattern? Well, I got into a sort of a habit of, of writing songs that were um, kind of traditional, that from that tradition that came right the way through the '60s, and with Blur, I guess as well. You know, like the Kinks and the Who and things like that. Um, but I think I learned how to write songs pretty much in public. Because my first couple of albums, it was it wasn't they weren't very developed songs, and and then I think I got more into writing developed songs, and I go into the studio and record them as I demoed them, pretty much doing all the album um, like that, and recording myself playing the drums and the bass and everything else like like that. But um, but gradually, I think with my last album, Spinning Top, I started to use. Um, other musicians have started leaving space for them to, um, you know, improvise or for, for something to happen that, that wasn't planned. And I did that a lot with this album as well. It's pretty much made up as it went along. Yeah, but well, A&E, you, were you pleased with the reception it got? Yeah, yeah. Um, really pleased. Quite sort of surprised, actually, <laughs> um, that that's something I started just to demo, just when I didn't have much to do. I just plug in a bass and at home and just play some riffs, put some drums on it, mess around with different drum sounds and then come up with um, words and things like that. Um, just for my own entertainment, I'm kind of surprised that something that I didn't even have in mind, how people might respond to it, has, has, has um, had people say nice things about it. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you had um, <coughs> 11 tracks on the album, but another 11 that didn't quite make it on the album, so is there going to be an A&E 2, as it were? Um, I'm not sure, yeah, I mean, as a rule you tend to over-record, and then, and, and then, I mean, the 10 on the album really are a kind of focused 10, and they really did for me sit together. The other, the other, it was 22 in all, and the, and the other 12 are really a little bit more of a mixed bag. There isn't so much of a focus, but they are a little more like I, I would expect people think me of doing. Yeah, if you know what I mean. They, they, that's sort of a bit more traditionally what people expect of me. So um, they're there. I don't know whether they'll be released. I mean, I'd like them to be released, but but also I have other preoccupations now that I'd like to maybe develop. So it's kind of I'm not quite sure what to do with those. Cool. With the with you know with Blur closing the the Olympic ceremony, is that uh, quite a big honour for you? Yeah, definitely. 
Well, it's it's always a, it's a sort of an honour to do such a massive show, and um, but I don't do so many, so that's it's always exciting. A lot of people are saying this could be the last Blur gig. Is that um, <coughs> true? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean it will be or it won't be. I know the question's been asked a million times. I have to ask it again, but you know, songwriting wise, with Blur, sort of future album wise, wh where where do we lie today on that one? I don't know, I can't remember the answers I've said before. <laughs> so, where are we? We're all in a good place, we're all getting on really well. Um, and that's that's just great for now, I think. The avenue's uh, definitely not closed off, put it that way. Sorry? It's not closed off, it's not a no. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's a no, but it's not a yes either. It, it, it really is something that, that we'd have to really carefully consider. And, and bear in mind our legacy, I suppose, for want of a better word. And um, it's kind of a, a pressure. There is a bit of a pressure to do more, but we don't want it just for the sake of it, just because people want to. We have to make sure that what we do is is is, is right. So it isn't just something I can be that blasé about, although I try to be. <laughs> I kind of. Um, it's, it's, there's another three people that could answer this question in a number of ways, so you know it's it's not an easy one to answer. But you know I love playing with them, and they're, and they're my favourite. You know they're my sort of brothers, really. So so it's um, I don't mind. Yeah, I was at the Glastonbury show, and it was yeah absolutely amazing. That's to be said, one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life. I mean, Damon, he was crying in front of the drums at one point, wasn't he? <laughs> Yeah, we all do that every now and then. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it was amazing. <laughs> I know, yeah, it was, it was emotional. Um, I don't know why he suddenly got emotional then. I, th I think you know, it just suddenly sort of hits you at times, just the reality of what you're doing. So, um, and and the um, the affection was pretty massive. And that, that sometimes, you know, for grown men, you know, it's a bit hard, <laughs> hard to take. You know. So, uh, yeah, it was lovely. Cool. And uh, you know, getting back to the Olympics, if you weren't such an amazing musician and you had to be an athlete in some event, what what event would you choose to be? You know, the top end. Two hundred meters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey. Why is that? Were, were you good at it? Or I was pretty good at athletics when I was a teenager. Yeah, I used to be able to. Well, if it wasn't for Dominic Critchley, I would have been pretty much the fastest in my year. But he was <laughs> like you know, advanced two or three years as a, as a human being in all ways <laughs> than we were. So it, was, it wasn't it was that fair. But 100 metre, 200 metre, discus, high jump, long jump, I was good at all that, D district sports and stuff like that. So you're looking forward to, you're going to be watching it, most of it? Doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think I've got some tickets for some swimming events. So, um, but I'm, I'm just worried about the... Um, the kind of chaos in and around yeah. the where the Olympics is going to be, and um, getting in there, I'm going to sort of, you know, maybe become a cannonball, get shot into it or something. <laughs> you know, no, I mean, I don't like congestion and loads of people, so yeah, the Olympics yeah. might not be the place for me. But I'll watch it on the telly, yeah, definitely, because my my daughter loves gymnastics, so we'll be looking at that. Right stuff. And um, I mean, recently you were in Falmouth in that hotel fire. What, was that scary? You know, was it quite a close call for yourself then? No, we all reported on it, but no, because I made sure where I set it. <laughs> oh, it's just the other side of the hotel. No, it was, it was a bit weird actually because we we had a room, a day room. We'd we'd arrived in Falmouth and and we were going to go home after the gig that night. So we had a day room so we could get changed and have a you know a bath and things like that. And, and so we went to the room and I'd have my bath and we're having a cup of tea in there in the lobby and Owen, our guitar player, he was up having a shower and <laughs> didn't really hear the alarm. <laughs> the alarm really wasn't going off in, in the room, weirdly. So we were all going off onto the lawn because the, the staff were saying we, we should really go out. <laughs> and then we watched the little bits of smoke and then more smoke and then oh, this fire and then it just completely, within three quarters of an hour, was out of control. It was, it was sad actually, because it was a really yeah. beautiful old 30s seafront hotel, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was terrible. Mm. But um, just looking at, say, looking back on your careers, both solo and with Blur, what, what would you say would, would be the sort of the highlights for both of them, for yourself, personally? 
I think actually getting back together with with Blur is a really big highlight for me, because because life in Blur at its height was was could be pretty confusing. Um, there wasn't much time to to think or get your head together. It was pretty much a, the scheduling of everything was you know record and tour and try and write something if you can record and tour and not an awful lot of time out. Because I suppose record companies think you have to sort of strike when the iron's hot and they warn you, you know, if you take a break in two years no one will know who you are and things like that. So we were always very aware of that. So we worked hard and hard and, and until we, we, we kind of were burnt out, so it's confusing. So when we came back, reformed and sort of mended our sort of um, relationships, you know, whatever, um, that just felt that we were doing it for the for good reasons again. To just to celebrate the music we made and our friendship and whatever like that, and uh, I think we played all of that for it. Before that, there was some time between um, Leisure and Modern Life is Rubbish, where we were doing some festivals, and, and during Modern Life is Rubbish, I think we, we were, uh, creatively, we were, I think we were really at a good place, where we were sort of in transition between getting out of a sort of a Manchestery sort of beat um, and, and, and finding our own sort of sound I suppose which um, which sort of went on to Modern Life is Rubbish which was also kind of then we arrived somewhere with Park Life so around that time it was good and then Park Life was where it was went berserk and stayed berserk for a number of years. <laughs> and what about personally uh, and say on, on, on solo level? What shows and things like that? Yeah just yeah yeah something that stands out in, in the solo aspect. I think I think I have a lot of fun on the stage. I love recording, but I have a lot of fun on the stage with with my group. Um, I, I, don't, I don't make them feel that, that, that there's a big pressure. I don't I don't mind, I refuse to sort of feel myself much much pressure. I kind of like to do what I like recording wise and live wise, um, because really it started as my hobby, and I still look at it in that way actually I don't allow it to get to that um, um, stage where I feel obligated so um, that's that, that that's kind of good and, and I think it sort of works actually I think it makes doing things for fun actually you can you can hear that on the records I think you can, it comes across so um, I think that's a good way to do it. What about it's talking about hobbies painting how's they uh, still painting? I'd like to paint more I, I, I seem to have a big um, surge of painting around when I do a release of an album when I'm doing the artwork to that but apart from that um, I don't really have much time I'm, I, I still really am fundamentally I guess a musician and that's where I well, that's where I you know, use up a lot of my energy and, and, and it does take up a lot of my energy so um, I mean I like, I like drawing and things like that I just don't do it enough I'd love to have a couple of months just in a in a barn with a load of paint. I mean, you know, one day. You know, I don't know, I don't know but, but right now I think, uh, you know, I'm not sure whether I'll be able to play the guitar or any other instrument as I want to in 20 years. I probably won't have the, the brain cells or the strength. So um, that's probably when I'll start <laughs> painting. Oh, I'm sure you will. But thanks, thanks a lot for your time. And okay. if, um, over your solo career, if you had mm. to pick sort of three three songs from your sort of eight albums um, for say for music news watchers that haven't quite grasped your solo career as yet wh which three would you say these sum me up? Uh, one of my favourites is um, well there's a couple I mean I, I quite like melancholy sounds although I'm probably known more for punky kind of stuff so there's another side to all of it, really, and, and I think there's a nice song called Just a State of Mind. That, um, there's a nice song called Don't Believe Anything I Say. And I think they're my, that's where I, I feel that like I'm sort of tell the truth a bit more, rather than, because um, with my punky songs, it's a sort of observational, it can be a bit sarky, you know. I only allow myself, I allow myself sarcasm if it's in lyrics. Mm -hmm. So um, I sort of go overboard with it sometimes. So those two songs are a good indication of the other side of, of things, you know. Great stuff. Do you, I mean, do you totally enjoy you enjoy your time on stage? Is that your heart and soul? Um, well, 
There's nothing worse than being in the middle of a show and really not enjoying yourself. Um, but it does take a while to sort of shake yourself out of that mood, and that's when audiences help. But I don't, I don't really like playing unless I'm putting my all into it. It's kind of um, such a waste, you know, to be sitting around all day and then the hour and a half that you actually are playing isn't satisfactory. That's kind of a depressing situation. So we try to make shows energetic and a good, good fun, really. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to tonight. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank Anything you. else you'd like to say to Music News Watchers? Um, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thanks a lot. Right. Thanks very much. Thank you. <coughs> Cool. Oh. That was great. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it.